Well, amen. Are you glad you're in God's house today? Give God a hand. What a blessing it is and what a celebration. And happy Father's Day. Fathers in the room, raise your hand. All right, let's give them a hand right now. And man, as we reflect back on this week and celebrate the goodness that we had this last week, here's what we know looking back. Uh, you saw the amazing VBS video with 167 salvations, uh, but what was even better than that? Not better than that. Nothing's better than a salvation. But even Thursday night when we had our comeback, we baptized 51, listen to this, 51 children, students, and parents. Man, what an amazing thing that was. And so if you happen to be new here uh, in person or either in person or online, I want to encourage you this. We started a series a couple of weeks uh, ago entitled Kingmaker, and it really comes with the idea that there are decisions that we can make and actions that we can take and words that we can say that literally will king us, make us kingmakers. But there are also, on the negative side of that, there are those actions that we can take that will break us. They will break our families, break our relationships, break our friendships. And ultimately, we're going to talk about this today, break our kids. Uh, if you missed any of those, I want to encourage you to go back. You can see them online. Uh, week one, we talked about the reality there, that we all have battles we have to fight. And how do we fight those well, and how do we uh, not fight those well? Last week, we talked about being a person of influence. How can you be a person of great uh, emotional, spiritual, uh, and uh, uh, business influence? And today, I want to talk to us about this, dads. Man, how can we be the kind of men that God wants us to be? And so I want to encourage you to tap in, take some notes, open up your Cottonwood Creek app, whatever it does. And so let's go back to our early verses we looked at as we kicked this series off. Um, here it is, and notice what it says. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 11. It said, the house, and notice this, it's kind of like the idea of a palace, all right? Someone who is a strong person. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent, notice uh, uh, the difference here, the small thing. Maybe you feel like I'm kind of small in this world. Notice what it says. But the tent of the small or the tent of the upright will flourish. And I love what uh, Solomon is saying there. He goes, listen, it doesn't matter how powerful you are. If you live a wicked life and if you make poor decisions, ultimately it's going to destroy your house, your children, your family, and your future. But he says, maybe you sit here today and you go, man, I'm a person of modest means. And so Solomon then turns around and says, listen, the tent of the righteous will flourish. And so wherever you are on that spectrum, if you feel like, man, God has really blessed me in a powerful and real way, I want to encourage you to live a righteous life because that's going to allow you and your family and your kids to sustain that legacy. And if you feel like I'm in a, a modest space right now, I want to encourage you, do the right thing and God will exalt you and give you the influence you desire. Here's the next one, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but, but sin condemns any people. And, and as we think about the pattern in Israel, was one that we can notice even today in our church, and in our cities, and in our country. The pattern in Israel, very clear. If you go look at First and Second Kings, that's where we're going to be at today, and you look at First and Second Chronicles, here's the pattern that you'll notice. Whoever the leader was, whoever the king was, that king would make decisions, develop policies, and those policies then would flow down, not just from the top, they didn't stay at the top, to all the people. And if a king was making godly decisions and good decisions, the people were blessed and they would flourish, whether they lived in a palace, a house, or in a tent. However, if you had a king uh, at the top who was making poor decisions or ungodly decisions or bad decisions, the effect of that was exactly the same. That from the top to the bottom, from the person in the palace to the tent, they suffered, they struggled, they went through incredible harm. So as we think about this whole series, it's always about us learning that the decisions that we make today will lead to our flourishing or our destruction. The decisions that we make today will encourage our kids, encourage our families, encourage us to move towards success, or will ultimately destroy our kids and destroy our family. And so as we think on this Father's Day, there's no better place to start than the idea that we want to be a king maker. I will tell you as a, as a dad, I want to be a king maker to my children. I want to be the kind of man, not perfect, 
that I leave a legacy, not of perfection, not pretending to be for perfect, but one that says, you know what, that's a pattern and a model and example for my children to follow. Notice this next passage, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. It says, the righteous man or the righteous lead blameless lives. And again, you might want to underline that word blameless. That word blameless doesn't mean perfect. It just means godly and good and uh, positive lives. The righteous man lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. How many of you in the room, male or female, you have children? How many of you want your kids to be blessed? 100%. 100%. I will tell you, even as we look at some of these kings today, and as I talk to men, and sometimes they're going through some things, and they've made some mistakes, or they've done some things that aren't God. I've never had a man, I've never had a woman, I've never had a person in my office over a cup of coffee tell me I really don't want my kids to be blessed. Never had it. Even, even with what you and I would consider some of the most unrighteous conversations and unrighteous people, when you look at the way they live their life, they will still say, I want my kids to have a better life than I have. I want my kids to be better off. I want my kids uh, to live in such a way that they are encouraged in their life. And so when it comes to Father's Day, Dad's like, I ran across another article this week. I'm always looking to the latest research and ran across a, an article. It's called In Praise of Fathers, all right? So dads, just listen in, tap in for a second. Uh, it's 10 research-based ways dads impact their kids for the better. And so what they did is they looked at all the scientific data. They looked at all the children, all the things that they had about homes, about cities, about the country, about uh, whether it's a boy or girl, whatever age they are. And uh, interestingly enough, some of the findings that they found today are exactly the same findings they found a decade ago, and a decade before that, and a decade before that. Boy, you've probably heard these statistics as I was reading this article. Um, you've heard some of these statistics that a child who doesn't have a father in the home, listen to this, a child that doesn't have a father in the home, you will have heard these over and over again. And I will tell you, according to research, these are just as true today as they were 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. So if a child grows up, boy or girl, and the dad is not in the home, kids are five times more likely to grow up below the poverty line. Five times more likely if a dad is not in the house. Here's another one. You ready? If dad's not in the house, uh, kids uh, are at an increased risk of sexual abuse. That, that means those that are looking to abuse someone, if a dad is absent, a strong figure is absent, they see that child, son or daughter, as a target. Here's another one. Kids who don't have a father in the home are two to three times more likely to use hard drugs. Two to three times more likely to use hard drugs. They are twice without a dad in the home. Children are twice as likely to drop out of school. They are two to three times more likely to have emotional and behavioral problems. Take a dad out of the house, kids are two to three times more likely to have emotional and behavioral problems. Here's another one. Kids without a father figure, a strong male figure in their lives, are more than twice as likely to end up in prison. Man, dads, we matter. Men, we matter. We live in a culture and a, war, and a world that wants to attack masculinity. I'm going to encourage you to stand strong and be a man, all right? That we don't cow down. If you cow down and reject masculinity, now let me also say, I would say appropriate masculinity. Does that make sense? All masculinity is not the same, just like all femininity is not the same, right? So I'm going to tell you, men, let's be men, but let's be appropriate men. Let's be the right kind of men. Don't expect that we're going to be perfect men, but let's bow up just a little bit, all right, and stand strong. Why? Because our kids need it. Our communities need it. Our cities need it. Our country needs men to step up and say, I'm going to be a man, and I don't care. I'm a little fired up. That's the negative. 
All right? If there's no dad in the house, that's the negative. Let me tell you the positive. This is according to research. You can go look at the article if you want to. Believe it or not, when men are acting appropriately in their masculinity, they actually raise children, boys and girls, turn out to be more compassionate, not less compassionate. Whoa. Wait, what? I, I thought our kids got their compassion from their mom. No, go look at the research. You want to know where kids really learn compassion? Is when a son or a daughter looks at their dad and thinks he's Superman. And he goes through some stuff. And he bows up for the kids. And he mans up for the kids. But at a certain point, he knows it's time to get on his knee. And be, be compassionate. To when mom's crying or hurting, that the son or daughter sees dad walk over and hug her. That this man... This superman all of a sudden turns on this flow of compassion. And guess what? Kids actually become more compassionate because they say, oh, life is hard and dad handles it. But when life gets hard on me, dad knows how to handle me. And so you want your kids to actually be more compassionate? It's not getting dad out. It's getting dads in their lives. Here's number two. It improves a child's self-confidence. You want to raise, conf raise confidence in courageous kids? Dad needs to be in the home. They need to be around. They need to encourage their kids. Sometimes dad needs to say, listen, you just need to suck it up, right? You, you need to life's hard. Man, life's difficult. And you're right. You're not always going to win. You're not always going to make every shot. You're going to step on the court, and someone's going to be better than you. But that doesn't keep you from stepping on the court again. Man, we develop a confidence in our kids that only happens when dad is in the home. Here's number three, improves educational outcome. You want your kids to succeed educationally? That doesn't mean everybody is uh, going to be in the Mensa Society. Uh, I don't even know how to spell that, by the way. But apparently there are a bunch of smart people in that. All right, but in general, you look at kids over communities, over cities, and in school districts, the one that do, ones that do the best consistently are the ones who have dad in the house. Here's another one. Uh, number four, listen, this, this doesn't sound right, but it's right. When a dad is in the home, children have more emotional stability. More emotional stability. In other words, they learn how to battle through these seasons and stay a bit more steady. Here's another. Here's another. Number five, with dads in the home, kids always experience a lower level of violence. They exhibit a lower level of violence. Just, just look around at, uh, at what is happening. If there is uh, someone uh, that, uh, that they, the, the, the teenage son or the teenage daughter, knows they have to come home to that is a man, they actually, when they are outside the house, exhibit less violent activity. They have. Why? Because there's no one to answer to when they come home. Here's another one. Six, uh, having a godly, good father in the house actually increases the respect of women because a son or a daughter says, look how dad treats mom. I want to do it that way. So ladies, let me tell you what, if you want to know if it matters, you, you want ladies to be treated better, we all do. Men need to be around who express appropriate love and encouragement and compassion uh, and respect for their wives. Here's the number seven. Improves relationship success. When a kid grows up, if dad's in the home, there's a way better chance that son or that daughter is going to have relationship success, uh, success later in their lives. Here's, I won't give you there are a couple of more. Here's the last one. How many of you want successful children? Best way to raise successful children is dads in the home. Statistics show it. It's not a question. So dads, I want you to know as we look through this idea, man, dads matter. Kids, your dads matter. They encourage us along the way. And so here, we, we've been in this series entitled Kingmaker. And what we do every week is we look at someone that is a bad example of how to fight a battle or how to be a good influence and someone who is a good example. 
And so today what I did is I looked through First and Second Kings, and I found a bunch of, a bunch of dads, and I just want to draw out just a couple of dads and encourage you with them. Uh, and I want you to know also if you look from Genesis to Revelation all the way through God's Word, there are actually more bad dads in the Bible than there are good dads. All right? Uh, That's what I love about God's Word. It doesn't show us one good dad after another good dad or after another good dad after another good dad that every dad is perfect. They're not. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of bad dads in the Bible. And they're put in the Bible to show us that a bad dad has a tendency to have a negative impact on their children. And so that's why I want us to understand. I mean, there is an opportunity here for us that if you would consider yourself, and, and don't raise your hand on this one, up to this point in your life, that you haven't been a great dad. Can I tell you this first guy I'm going to talk about? He's going to bring us hope. First dad I want to talk to us about is a bad dad. His name was Manasseh. And if you know anything about the southern and northern kingdom of Israel, uh, if you're going through First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles, it's kind of hard to track. All right, uh, who's this king? Is he in the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom? And after the kingdom is then divided, is he is he good? Is he bad? All of those things. Most of the time, just a general pattern. If you were reading through, you're like, all right, where are they? If it's a bad king, chances are they were in the north. If it was a good king, they were in the south. However, from time to time, those are flipped. And the first guy we're going to talk about is a guy named Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh is a king in the southern kingdom. He ruled for 55 years. Uh, He was a sorry dude. Everybody say sorry dude. dude. There wasn't a day that went by in Manasseh's early life that he didn't meet his quota of human depravity. I'm just telling you, it was awful, followed by awful, followed by awful, followed by awful. However, you go to the end of Manasseh's life, You go to the end of Manasseh's life, and it says he repented and cried out to God. So here's the bad and the hope. You ready? The bad is he spent a lot of his life doing everything he could to fulfill his own fleshly desires, to lead the children of Israel away from God and his children away from God, and he hurt a lot of people along the way. However, at the end of his life, he cried out to God and he repented. So here's the hope after the bad. Maybe there's some men in this room that you have sent your sons or your daughters off and you reflect back on your dadship or fathership and you go, I wasn't a very good dad. Can I tell you, Manasseh tells us there's still hope. Manasseh turned out to be a pretty good granddad. And so if there's a man in this room and you're middle age or older age and you look back, and I will tell you there's not a man in this room. If, if you have kids, there's not a man in this room that doesn't live with some sort of regret. How many of us understand that? How many of you wish you would have had another year with your kids? I wish you could do over those three-year-old seasons or those teenage conversations or those early 20s conversations, or those newlywed conversations. Everybody in here lives with a season of regret. But this guy Manasseh ruled in Judah for 55 years. Human depravity, bad decisions, hard decisions, hurt tons of people. At the end of the day, he repented and cried out. So my invitation to you, maybe there's a man in here that you're in your 50s or your 60s or or, or maybe you're even in your 70s and you look back and go, man, I was a pretty bad dad. Can I tell you, Manasseh tells us there's hope because at the end of his days, he repented to God and went back. And so that's the invitation to you. You're not left out. We're also going to see when we cover the next two, But it's actually not the dad that makes the difference. We're going to see here in a bit, it's an incredible uncle. An uncle that takes care of a nephew and a niece. That an uncle raises them. So maybe there's men in here that, that, man, you're like, I'm not a dad or I I, I want to be a dad someday. Are you an uncle? Do you have a, a niece or a nephew that you can positively impact? You're not even the biological father, but we're going to see an example where an uncle steps in and protects a king, and that king ultimately ends up being one of the greatest kings Israel ever had. We're also going to see another man that 
And the father wasn't that good. The father really wasn't that good. But he established a great relationship with some good friends. You're going to see it. I'm going to read it here in a second. I love it. He says he looked at him and he says, are you with me? This is not a great father. But he looks at a godly man. He's called the Rechabites. If you go read about the Rechabites, they're not, they don't get a lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot of writing. You can find more about them in Jeremiah. But you'll see that this king looks at the Rechabites who, you look in Jeremiah, were some of the godliest men around. And the king looks at him and says, are you with me? And he says, yes. And it says, the king put his hand out to these new friends, and he says, get up in my chariot. And maybe there's some men here today, when you look at your past, you think, man, there's no way I can really change things. Can you take a hand of a godly man and bring him into your chariot and say, let's do this thing together, and I'm going to learn from you how I need to be a better dad. So I want you to know, wherever you are in this room today, there is hope, there is encouragement. If you are a grandfather, you still play a part. If you are a father, you still have a season. If you are an uncle, man, you play a part. If you're a godly man, you can be a friend to someone who's trying to figure it out on their journey. So let's start by talking about this uh, ungodly Manasseh. Man, he, let me just tell everybody say sorry dog. Y'all didn't say that with much enthusiasm because he's a sorry dog. Let's just pick it up. Look at it. Hey, here it is, 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 1. He's one of the few bad kings in the southern kingdom. Here it is. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 55 years. Uh, here, are the rain, here are all the wrong things that he did. Human depravity. He rebuilt the high places. His father, Hezekiah, had torn down and destroyed. His father had torn them down. He ultimately built them back up. Here's number two. He erected altars to Baal uh, and made an Asherah pole. That's number three. Altars to Baal, Asherah pole, uh, as Ahab, the king of the north, had also done. So here's what he's saying. We expect Ahab to do those things in Jezebel. But he says he's doing them just down in the south. He's trying to keep up. And then notice what it says. Uh, he says, he bowed down to all the starry hosts, worshiped them, the, the gods of culture that day. He built altars in the temple of the Lord. He actually went into the temple of the Lord and built altars to the Lord, uh, which the Lord said, hey, in Jerusalem, I'll put my name. He went directly against God's uh, plan in two courts of the temple. He also built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed, listen to this, his own son in the fire. Everybody said, that's a bad king. He, he built altars, led the children away. Remember, the policies that happen at the top end up affecting the people at the bottom. The people at the bottom begin to struggle all the way through, but it wasn't just the people at the bottom. It was his family. This guy was so demented that he took his sons and his daughters, if you read elsewhere, and sacrificed them to other gods. Man, you go all the way back in the Old Testament over and over and over again. God said, don't do that. That's what pagans do. Don't do that. That's what pagans do. Don't do that. That's what pagans do. And this is exactly what he did. And he ruled for 55 years and he journeyed on. But here's the hope. Even though he fulfilled his daily quota of human depravity, at the end of his life, he cried out and repented to God. And so maybe there's some men in this room that if you look from the moment you were born to the moment you became a dad or the moment you became a man up until now, you have been filled with human depravity and sin. There's hope for you. Let today be the day that you repent and turn and move back. All right, let's move to a good king. Uh, we want to get away from him. Uh, a guy named Jehu. By the way, he was a good king, wasn't a great dad. But I'll show him to you in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 15. It says, after he, Jehu, by the way, Jehu's up in the north. He's one of the good kings of the north. Uh, left there, he came upon this guy, Jehonadab, son of Rechabah. That's the Rechabites. If you go look, Jeremiah chapter 34 and other places, you say, who is Rechabah and who are the Rechabites? They're godly men. They are men that kept the covenant, kept the faith. When all of Israel was going in the wrong direction, they stayed faithful to the covenant and faithful to the Lord. And so here's what you have. When he came, he came upon Jonah, Jonadab, uh, son of Rechab, who was in his way to meet him. Jehu, this is the king, greeted him and said, are you in accord with me as I am with you? He's saying, listen, in the midst of this craziness, I'm not a great dad, but I want to be a good king and I want to follow God. 
And he stops and he asks Rika, he says, are you in accord with me? In other words, can we go in the right direction to raise our children, to lead this nation, to be godly men as examples for our sons and our daughters? And so we ask him the question, are you with me? Are you against me? Are you for me or not? And notice the response. He says, are you in accord with me as I am with you? And notice what his response was, I am. If so, said uh, Jehu, give me your hand. So he did, and Jehu helped him up into the chariot. Jehu said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And then he had him ride along in his chariot. So here's the idea. First king, bad king, repented at the end. You and I can have hope that depart, uh, regardless of where we've been, we can have an impact in our grandparenting years. Here's number two. Here's a king that tries. You, if you read some of the story, Jehu wasn't a great father, but he was a good king. But what he did do is he found other godly men to say, get in the chariot with me as I lead our nation and as I lead my family. So, men, let me encourage you with this. Don't go it alone. Search out and seek out good and godly men to say, get in the chariot with me because my children, our cities, our nation needs. That's why we always drive you to go to groups. We have men's groups. We have women's groups. We have mixed groups. We have couples groups. Man, I want to encourage you. Tuesday morning men's Bible study, 6 a.m. Come on, my pastor's Bible study. Man, it's just about getting other men in the chariot with you. Now, why do they ride in a chariot? because there's a battle ahead and guys i want you to know when you go into your next battle you don't want to have to fight that battle alone you want to have the right men who are beside you and in your chariot as you fight here's another one you ready here's the uncle let's go on to jehoiada uh, 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. What you have is you have one of these crazy things where uh, uh, one king dies, and, and after he is killed, the mom of that king decides, hey, I see this as an opportunity. I'm going to kill all my competition. And just like you see in some of the movies or, or Shakespeare novel, that's exactly what you have right here. All right, so here it is. Uh, it says, when Athaliah, uh, you might want to just say, if you're Hunter One Dalmatians fan, Cruella de Vil. All right, that's what we'll say. The mother of Azahiah, saw that her son, the king, was dead. She proceeded, she saw an opportunity to destroy the whole royal family. But Jehoshaphat, uh, the daughter of the king of Jerome, uh, and the sister of Azahiah, there'll be a test, by the way, before you get into heaven, you're going to have to know who all these people are, by the way. So you might want to listen, you might want to tap in all this. I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, took Joash, everybody say Joash. Joash, son of Ahaziah, stole him away from among the royal princes who were about to be murdered. She put him in the nurse, uh, with the nurse, hit him uh, along with it. Now notice what they did. So he, Joash, was not killed. He remained hidden with his nurse in the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled. So listen, Cruella de Vil did end up ruling. She thought she had killed the competition away. But guess what? This uncle... had taken this son, Joash, and brought him into the temple and hid him and trained him and taught him the ways of the Lord in the temple. You've probably seen some of these diagrams. So here it is, an uncle, not even the biological father, that says Joash is the rightful king. And Joash is going to be a great king, but he's too young. And so the uncle takes him and he begins to teach him the precepts of the Lord. And he keeps him in the temple for six years. Now, we don't have time. I won't read the rest of it. But just go look at Open the app. Go read the verses. Because after six years, here's what the uncle does. The priest, he calls all the men together, the men he knew that served God and not Cruella de Vil, not the wrong queen. And he says, listen, guys, I got a great thing. I've got a secret I need to tell you, and it's time. Joash, the king, is alive. He is not dead. And he says, men, we'll make a covenant together, and we're going to put the right man back on the right throne, and he's going to lead God's people in the right way. And so the men who are around the uncle came, and they saw Joash, who's now seven years old, said, absolutely, let's crown him. And so they crown him right there. 
And then they gather them together and they go out and they present Joash as this little bitty king. And here's what it says. The uncle and all the men swore to protect him. You say, Pastor, how does that apply today? We have a culture that wants to kill our kids. Satan wants to lead your kids away and my kids away. Whether you're a biological dad or not, whether you're an uncle or someone else, a stepdad, do everything you can to protect your kids. And notice where they took him to protect him and raise him up into the temple. Man, I want to encourage you, church won't fix everything, but it'll sure help a lot. And I want you to know, if you just have a child or if you have a teenager, man, get them to God's house. Find somebody that will come along. It may not be the uncle. It might be our student ministry. It might be the children's ministry that are teaching alongside our kids to raise them up. And guess what? Notice what he didn't do. He didn't throw a two-year-old Joash out to the wolves. He waited until he grew up. He gathered the right army around him, and then he presented the king and put the crown on his head. And it says, Cruella de Vil hated it and tried to kill him. See, she didn't stop her hatred. She didn't step back and say, oh, we get it. She ultimately wanted to destroy him, but didn't. Why? Because an uncle cared enough to make sure this child got into God's house. So men, women, moms, dads, I want to encourage you, surround yourself with people who will get in your chariot and fight your battles with you. Get yourself some good friends, men. Beyond that, Whatever you do, find yourself some children, some sons or some daughters that you can help raise up, that you can teach God's Word, that you can move them in the right way. Why? Because good fathers, godly fathers, absolutely make a difference. So how can we be a good dad? Here's what we're going to close with real quick. Number one, good father always does five things as best they can. First of all, they know God and teaches his children, a good father knows God and teaches his children about the faith. Men, I want to encourage you. Man, you say, I don't know what to teach them. Well, let's start learning. Let's start developing. Get yourself in a Bible study. Start learning something. Listen to some podcasts. Grow it up and begin to talk about it. Little Proverbs 22 says, man, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, when they're old, they will not depart from it. A lot of people think that's a promise. I want you to know it's a proverb. There's a difference. See, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to bring my kids to church and they're going to turn out fine. That's a proverb. The idea of train them up, point them in the right direction, surround them with godly people, make sure they have God's word, and then someday you're going to have to send them off. Let's say they go the wrong way, they become a prodigal. The proverb is, is that somewhere down the road, it's not always a promise, but it is a proverb, most of the time they will come back. Most of the time, they'll come back. Remember the prodigal son, story of the prodigal son? Man, it, 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 he didn't come back day one. He spent all of his inheritance. He spent everything he had. He had to come to the end of himself. Can you imagine the heart of the father that was crushed because his son that he loved, his son that he raised, he wanted so much more for him. But all of a sudden, that son struggled but wouldn't repent and wouldn't come back. But Proverbs 22 comes into play. He turned around came back to his father. So a godly dad, men, we need to know God first. Have you ever accepted Christ as Savior and Lord? Men, we need to journey in such a way that we live in such a way that I am constantly teaching my kids. I'm making sure that I'm getting them to God's house. So not only am I teaching God's kids, others are teaching God's kids. Here's the second thing we want to do. Provide, provide an example that is worth following. Dad's what habit what things you say, what things do you do, that if all of a sudden your kids walked up in front of you and in front of others, immediately mimicked your behavior. If they said some of the things that you said or did some of the things that you did, all of a sudden in public, would you feel a sense of shame? If so, then go ahead and change that in your own life. That, man, we would lead an example and live by example that our kids can follow. Here's number three. Loves, a good father, loves and disciplines his children appropriately. Let me tell you what, part of being a dad is we say there's the rules. Here is the playing field. When you step outside this box, 
There are always consequences. You say, Pastor, do I need to do that? Absolutely. But notice I use the word appropriately. I mean, we're not looking to go all willy-nilly with the discipline, right? But we also need to understand, let our kids very much know that there are consequences to bad behavior. There are consequences to failure. And why do you do that? Because you want to train them up in such a way that they know, man, there are things that I can do that bring me the most amount of success as possible. And that's where we want to live. And part of that is discipline and drive and move and, and conversations that you have. Here's number four, best thing you can do, a good man, godly father, honors his wife and the mother of his children. That's one of the best things you can do is honor your children's mom. Honor your wife. I know we live in an age of blended families. And I've sadly over the years and still even seasons now, I've seen, man, some of the worst custody battles I have ever could have imagined. Can I just encourage you with this? And I know I'm getting into your business and I know I'm ripping some scabs off. For the good of your kids, step back. Begin to honor the father. Begin to honor the mother even if they're in these difficult seasons. Why? Because there comes a point in my life and your life where our children matter more than we do. It does. Finally, number five, give God a hand on that. <laughs> number five, godly father, model selfless sacrifice and service to others. Man, when we have a serving opportunity, Dad, bring your sons or daughters up here. And whether we're packing bags or delivering this or doing that or serving in VBS, man, bring your kids up. And if you'll do those five things, you'll be well on your way to being a good dad and not a bad one. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for an opportunity just to be real and be honest. God, here at Cottonwood Creek, you know we don't back away from masculinity. We're not going to cow down to a culture that wants to feminize all of us because our children need more. They need us to be who you want us to be. God, every man in this room, including the one that is praying right now, looks back as a father and would love to have a do-over, would love to have a better conversation or a different conversation. But God, we don't get that opportunity. But I do get today and tomorrow, and the days ahead. Let us be that kind of church and those kind of men because our children deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Were you glad you're in God's house today? Amen.